All right, without further ado, um, we can go ahead and get started with the presentation. My name is Cedric Clyburn. Uh, I am a developer advocate at Red Hat. Um, you can uh, you find me on Twitter at Cedric Clyburn. Uh, and I'm very excited to be here uh, to kind of discuss the AI developer experience and going uh, from uh, the side of both a data scientist and an application developer and also ML engineering to kind of create a whole story about how we can take our models, we can build them, train them, test them, uh, fine tune them, and then deploy them onto uh, uh, Kubernetes, which we're going to be doing today, uh, and then go from the side of an application developer uh, and actually scaffold a project that's inferencing that API uh, and, and show this whole story today in the session. So we have a lot to, to cover. Uh, we're going to be demoing um, a good amount of open source projects today. Kubeflow, KServe, uh, Jupyter Hub. We're going to be using a lot of libraries, PyTorch. Um, so thanks for being uh, along with me for this journey. Uh, before we begin, uh, I want to say a little bit about myself. I'm a developer advocate at Red Hat, formerly an OpenShift developer advocate, so a lot of experience with Kubernetes. Uh, I also uh, am from Red Hat developers specifically, where I create blogs, cheat sheets. I'm working on my first book uh, about a variety of uh, developer tools. Uh, and um, uh, technologies that you can use with uh, Kubernetes uh, for CI CD, things like Tekton and Argo CD, which we'll also be seeing. Um, and I create labs with Instruct as well, so uh, interactive labs where you can uh, progress through the steps and, and, uh, and use technologies like Argo CD in your browser without having to inst install anything. So uh, I do a lot, also a little bit with IBM there. I make these really cool whiteboard videos that you can find on YouTube. Uh, that one's Podman versus Docker. There's some other cool ones out there. And uh, if we don't have time to, to connect here or, or uh, do the Q&A, then I, I've got Twitter and LinkedIn, which you can reach out to me, and uh, I'll try to ask or answer any questions that you might have. Um, and I think in general, before we start this presentation, it's really cool to be here because open, uh, open source is really driving a lot of the innovations that we're going to see uh, in the demo that we're, we're going to be running through. Uh, and you know. It's, it's kind of why I'm here and why we can all be here at this conference. So thanks to the organizers for making this happen. Uh, I want to ask a little bit about you now. Um, here you can see the beautiful school of Athens uh, by Raphael. You know, there's people in this painting such as Plato, Socrates, Aristotle. How does this relate to the presentation? Well, I want to ask um, to learn a little bit more about you and your role. So just with a show of hands, um, I'd love to know. So. Uh, who are you? Are you maybe a data scientist? Sweet. OK, two, two data scientists. Uh, or are you in operations? Cool. And this is probably going to be the most amount of people. Developers? Fantastic. OK, great. So myself included as a developer. Um, just you know, this is really helpful to know uh, a little bit more about, about you, what you do, so I can kind of tailor it towards uh, that aspect. Um, and one more follow-up question I kind of want to ask. Uh, when it comes to working with models and deploying models, are we uh, maybe in the beginning stages of, of testing things, of creating these models? Um, show of hands, beginner or intermediate. We've created the models. We're serving them. We're, we're working with intelligent applications. Or expert, you know, performance, utilization. We're trying to save money at this point because our compute bills are too high. OK, fantastic. Well, this is great um, because we're going to go through the whole flow. Um, and so if you haven't had experience as a data scientist, that's OK, because I'll explain everything as we go through Jupyter Hub. Um, but without further ado, you know, I don't have to say that AI has kind of permeated about every aspect of our lives, um, especially when it comes to development. I mean, I was just at GitHub Universe's conference about a month ago, where you probably heard the announcement that GitHub is completely rebranding itself, right, on AI uh, with Copilot. And I think AI is just now an essential part of how we're driving value for our organizations and for our businesses. And at Red Hat here, we've got uh, Ansible Lightspeed, which is based on IBM's Watson X, where you can kind of uh, you know, define infrastructure just from natural language. Say I want an EC2 instance with this type of security, you know, I can type that, uh, and the code will be written out for me. So it's, it's really impressive to see all the developments that we have. Uh, you probably heard about Grok yesterday. Um, 
around generative AI. And I think it's really changing the way that we work uh, with customers and what our customers are expecting from us because there's so many use cases, right? Uh, in industries and in, uh, governments and banks for fraud detection, for all these different models that we can bring to the table. Uh, and these advantages are, are really immense, but it's really, really essential to ensure that the models that we're working with are firstly running efficiently, right? Running reliably, and uh, most importantly, running securely. So this kind of brings me to the AI and ML development life cycle. So from talking to customers at Red Hat, right, a lot of feedback that we've gotten back is that their AI and ML models are not making it to production. And that's because there's a lot of complexity from the building and the deploying and the monitoring of these models in production, right? Not just in a development sense, but actually putting them onto a cluster, running them wherever it might be. Uh, so I want to start off this presentation with the AI ML space and the different personas that are involved in the creation, right? We talked about us in the audience as developers, as data scientists, as operations. Uh, but I want to talk about who is really involved in the creation because I was fortunate enough to be born in a world where uh, DevOps was always a thing, right? And I think I've learned a lot, and we've all learned a lot from these DevOps principles. But when we look at how AI and ML development is working, there's these new complexities that have been introduced in the software development pipeline, right? It's not just development and operations now. And with these different personas, there's always going to be friction occurring back and forth, right? So let's look really quickly at some of the key roles. Of course, business leadership, they're defining goals and the metrics, right? The data engineers are going to gather and prepare the data. The data scientists, right? They're using Jupyter Hub, they're using TensorFlow, uh, PyTorch, uh, which we're going to be using today. Application developers, someone like myself, right? I'm going to deploy the models with an application, uh, whether it's a Flask app doing gRPC calls. Uh, and then we also have the ML engineers and the IT operations. We can't forget about those guys. They're going to handle the monitoring and the management, right? But the challenges that organizations and enterprises are facing uh, that we see a lot when we're talking to customers is very different from what we're seeing in the research space. It's how do I take what I want to do with AI and actually operationalize it. And that's a huge barrier for adoption in these industries. And it's not you know, the Googles and the Microsofts that have so much money to throw in this space. It's the average company that has to put in all this work just to operationalize a model and get that final output, which is this beautiful AI-infused application, right? And so these different personas, right, they need to interact. And so we start off with the business leadership here, which is, of course, defining the goals and metrics. And then afterwards, the second part of the process, right, the data engineer gathers and prepares the data. But there's so many considerations, right, when it comes to this. We're we going to store our data. Uh, is it going to be in an S3 bucket like we're going to be doing today? Or does it need to be on-premises or another server elsewhere that's not even S3? Maybe it's a data lake, you know, data exploration and data preparation. Are we going to have to do that? Um, are we going to have to address, uh, you know, stream data or uh, stream processing data with Kafka? Uh, maybe we have to use Starburst uh, in order to process some of this data before that the data scientists can actually work on conducting experiments and building out a model. Maybe they're using a foundational model, as we're going to do with a model from Hugging Face today. Uh, but they're going to be working in their environment, right? This is a Jupyter notebook. They're going to have some libraries. Uh, they're going to be using TensorFlow or PyTorch. Uh, and when it comes to working with you know, these Jupyter notebooks, we want it all to be in, for example, a containerized environment for that reproducibility and scalability. Now, next, someone like me, an de application developer, is then going to enter in the flow uh, down here in this section when it comes to actually de deploying our models and actually creating these intelligent enabled applications. Um, and of course, we're going to discuss MLOps today in this presentation uh, and pipelines and how we can automate all of this. Uh, but say a data scientist is going to be serving their model, uh, we can do these calls to an application, uh, and we're going to utilize Kubernetes to perform all of this uh, and do uh, you know, inferences on our model. And then finally, um, you know, the work doesn't stop there once we have our intelligent application and our model being served. We've got to continuously monitor and manage it here at the end to make sure that the models aren't drifting, that the predictions are accurate, um, and you know, that the model isn't slowly drifting without us even noticing. So we have to kind of iterate. We have to go back a little bit and retrain the model if we need to. And you'll notice that the ML engineer 
and the IT operations are involved in all of these steps throughout the entire process because they've got this vested interest, right, in making sure that these open source tools and technologies we're using uh, are safe, are you know susceptible to network compromises and hacking. Uh, they maintain the security of the network and. In this chart, we haven't even mentioned InfoSec and ProdSec, which are along for the entire uh, process as well. And so you look at this, and it's a huge graph. And you're, you know, you're probably wondering, you know, why is it so complicated to operationalize this model development? And that's because here in the middle is uh, this little clear box that represents such a small piece of this. And this is the research work that's happening, right? It's the building of the model. It's people iterating over things. Uh, and when you start to do this on an enterprise level, things start to get kind of complicated, right? So there's the configuration of the serving infrastructure to be able to run these models. There's the data collection and the feature extraction and uh, the actual management of the infrastructure to be able to scale up and scale out with our models. And uh, things like monitoring tools, all these different aspects that we have to think about when we actually go into production. And we talk to customers and you know, they don't expect to see any of this, but you do when you actually approach the point where you have to productize and, and serve these models and applications uh, on a large scale. Um, and, you know, they keep coming back and they're saying, you know, it's fine, we're running these models on our laptops and it's great for experimentation, but when we actually go to the next stage, uh, that's when you kind of start to run into issues with all of this. Um, and so I think it's kind of it's similar to kind of paint this picture of how DevOps kind of emerged, you know, running software at scale. And we're slowly seeing the same thing with uh, AI and ML ops, which we'll be kind of diving into today. Um, because corporations will have an ML engineer that come up to them with their Jupyter Hub notebook out or running this application in a Flask app and, and show this really cool model. Uh, and this happened for us when we were developing Ansible Lightspeed. We had it, uh, you know, in a Flask app and we were trying to show these different experiments we were running. Um, but when it came time to scale up and scale out, uh, you need the infrastructure and the scaling and all these different components to be, up, to be able to actually do that. So uh, it's kind of a, a learning process for organizations to have to go through. Um, but the platform that we have to have to support all of this and these AI ML models needs to be how we treat software, right? It's got to be rigorous processes for change management and data verification, for testing, for new feature development, uh, everything that we've been doing for the past 10 years or so. Because while it's really cool to just think about, you know, ChatGPT or Llama or, you know, the top of the iceberg, we've got all this infrastructure below that's going on, right, that's supporting the actual model being served. Uh, and so that's kind of what we're going to take a look at today and see how open source uh, is kind of playing the role in the foundation of open, of AI and ML models. Um, so another representation of that iceberg that we just saw is this cool little, well, not as cool, but it's kind of uh, you know, a stat graph that uh, shows that you know, AI is software, right? The models on top is being held up by everything underneath. And we're kind of gonna get a dive into this and learn how everything plays together when it comes to open source. Um, because of course, uh, you know, it's software at the end of the day. It needs to consume hardware resources. So we need to be able to schedule it. Uh, we need to be able to use technologies like containers. And of course, how do we schedule, you know, containers and orchestrate them, you know, tools like Kubernetes. Um, so we'll have to automate software delivery. Uh, we'll be able to build and update our models at the same time and automate all of that. Um, and then, of course, if we take a look at the higher part of the stack, this is what the data scientist is really working on, right? The tools and the libraries and the IDEs such as Jupyter Hub uh, and the frameworks. And if you take a look from a macro perspective, everything that has been layered on can't be missing, right? We need to start from the beginning. Uh, and to do that, uh, you know, should we build out our own platform with all of these? Well, there's a great quote by Peter Drucker uh, that says there's nothing surely quite as useless as doing with great efficiency what shouldn't be done at all, which is corporate lingo for don't reinvent the wheel, right? So the way that we kind of want to approach this uh, as developers, as data scientists, as operations is to focus our time on activities that actually improve, you know, what we're doing, right? Uh, and not so much the things that don't at all, right? So this could be including maintaining old technologies that we don't need or not taking advantage of the huge ecosystem that Kubernetes provides, especially uh, in the AI ML space. And if we lean more into the left side here, 
we can focus spending more time on creating these cool models and, and building the applications that implement them uh, and outsource the rest over here. And where do we outsource that to? Well, uh, you probably knew the answer because I'm from Red Hat, but uh, it's to open source, right? Because when we talk about infrastructure and platforms, there's so many problems and challenges that other people have also encountered before you in their journey of working with AI ML. Uh, and maybe in a completely different setting, but maybe in the same. Uh, and there's chances that there's pretty cool libraries or packages or software that's already been developed to solve the specific problem that you're going through, right? So the open source community, it's full of this, right? From really small projects, a couple maintainers, to really big projects like Kubeflow that we're using today, you know, that have become pretty much the standard for model experimentation on top of Kubernetes. And we're talking about the collaboration from organiza organizations that might be competing against each other, but still are putting their best people out to develop these technologies. Um, and so we're also creating these open standards and as a whole innovating the industry uh, that we're working with. And so how does this tie into your AI stack? Well, it starts off with the top, right, for a data scientist. You know, we're working with things like TensorFlow, PyTorch, SkyKit-Learn, uh, whatever it might be that our data scientists are using, right? And uh, they're also working with languages like Python and R and different development environments, whether it's JupyterHub or using Lyra for, you know, pipeline creation, right? Then we go down one more layer. We're talking about huge, huge interactive ecosystem of tools for these different stages of data processing and modeling. Uh, things like Kubeflow, MLflow, KServe, Airflow, uh, to put everything together. And I want to take a look at the bottom as well, right? Because we're talking about software. Software is just, you know, something that needs to consume computer resources. And how are we doing that? How are we scheduling that? Well, of course, with Linux at the foundation, right? You know, the most popular open source soft, uh, operating system that's out there. And also taking advantage of things like CUDA for GPU acceleration of the training of our models. And then we go up one more part of the stack, right? We're talking about technologies that have made our lives easier as developers, like Docker and Podman, and effectively being able to scale out our processes and microservices in a cluster uh, on, say, Kubernetes, for example, and take advantage of the huge ecosystem that's there. And then on top of that, we kind of talk about operating containers at scale and some of the components that include uh, monitoring with Prometheus and Grafana, uh, you know, things like Helm charts, operators, and continuously being able to deploy our software with technologies like Tekton and Argo, right? All these nice tools for auditing and building things. And then finally, we talk about software-defined storage. You know, when we're working with these models, we've got an immense amount of, of different pieces going on. Uh, also, integration, you know, we need to be able to use tools like Istio and, and CamelK to do maybe automatic encryption of requests. And I, I don't want to go into too much detail here in this huge stack because we're going to see it in action, but you kind of get the point, right? Open source is everywhere when you look at the stack and the infrastructure when it comes to working with AI models. Um, and the lower part, it's something that's not very new, right? We've been working with this uh, for a good amount of time, you know, 10 years at this point. Uh, it's a, you know, a great plethora of different items to, uh, to, to, to create a platform, right? Whether it's Kubernetes or OpenShift or whatever you're using that f kind of bundles this together. But the top part is what we're seeing more and more, uh, which is what the AI developers are using, the data scientists are using, and they're building on top of this lower stack that we have here. And so we can say there's you know, so many great open source uh, you know, projects out there. Let's go ahead and let's build our own platform. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> it's a little bit of work and one doesn't simply, you know, build a platform, right? It's a very massively complex thing. It's hard to integrate all that together and I like to think about it in this way, right? So you've got uh, my favorite metaphor here for platform building. It's a car, right? It's a transportation platform. The goal is to get you from point A to point B. That's it, you know, it does a great job. And so, a core piece of this platform, right, is this machine learning or AI model, where it's the engine that really enables this thing. Uh, but you can't go anywhere in a car with just the engine, right? You need all the other pieces around it that are so critical, like, uh, you know, every, every other component in the car, the computer systems, the, the wheels, everything else, to be able to integrate together. And you have to train a team to be able to pull all the, put all those pieces together. Right, so we're not talking about just movement, but we're also talking about the people that are gonna be moved in the car. 
uh, you know, all the management, the integration, the testing of the card that has to happen. So it's not a trivial thing. And what's really tough in software with that stack graph that I just showed you is that all these pieces have a tendency to become updated, right? Very quickly, and you don't want to make you want to make sure that these updates don't brick your car or your platform in that case. Uh, and so, how do we handle this? Well, I'm sure you probably know the answer because open source is really what's powering all of this, right? At Red Hat, we've been knowing this for 30 years before I was even here. Um, think about like the Linux kernel and taking that into Fedora and then productizing that with RHEL. Uh, and so we work with the communities over a million open source projects that we don't work with, but we contribute to in a variety of different ways for virtualization, for OpenStack, whatever it might be. Specifically in today's use case, Kubernetes. Uh, and we have an upstream first mentality where we're contributing uh, upstream. Uh, so essentially what's happening is we're bringing projects together in this middle part for the integration uh, sometimes into one project. So for example, Fedora, right? And this is a community that we sometimes manage or steer. Uh, and eventually we stabilize them at the end into these product branches. And this is where we provide stability for our customers. That's the business model, essentially the secret sauce of Red Hat right there. Uh, and this is how we bring the power of open source into different industries wherever we are. And it really helps when uh, companies at the end there need to be stringent in terms of security and the compliance and governance. Uh, and this is what we do when it comes to open source AI. So who here is already using Kubernetes? OK, fantastic. So about half the crowd. So uh, you know, at Red Hat, we, we are a huge contributor to Kubernetes, right? And we do a lot of things with infrastructure. But, but mainly, uh, and especially what I do in my job, revolves around the world of Kubernetes. And so uh, we bring together a lot of different tools into, uh, to, to, to OpenShift, and then we contribute upstream for any conversations that we're having with customers uh, about features that they'd like to see. Uh, and so many of the features you see in Kubernetes has just gone upstream from uh, OpenShift talking to different customers and different areas. Uh, and, and that's kind of how we contribute for a distribution of uh, Kubernetes. But think about this in a different way uh, for the open source uh, industry, or sorry, for the AI ML industry. Uh, so what we're doing here that you might have not have heard of, if you've heard of OpenShift, this is a fairly uh, different but, uh, but similar because it's built on top of OpenShift. It's called Open Data Hub. And so uh, it's a curation of all these different projects that we talked about there on the stack into one place uh, using Kubernetes as a platform. So this includes all the data science tools for TensorFlow and PyTorch, uh, other machine learning frameworks, and then JupyterHub as a multi-tenant IDE that our, our, our data scientists can collaborate on. Uh, things like Spark for data processing, uh, Seldon and Kser for model serving, uh, and allows us to leverage Kubernetes and Kubernetes operators uh, to make this happen. And so we're trying to kind of contribute upsource to these projects but also make it easier for all the different personas that are involved in AI ML, like how we saw in that uh, first chart with data scientists and ML engineers and app developers uh, to make it easier. And so this is kind of how we work. And a quick plug here uh, is just that we have this kind of offering for AI uh, and ML called Red Hat OpenShift AI. Uh, this is the productized version of it, uh, similar to how Red Hat Enterprise Linux exists, um, giving you the foundation of OpenShift and running on top of Red Hat Enterprise Linux with the support of, uh, of Red Hat for the hybrid cloud. So that's pretty neat. But uh, you know, we couldn't talk about AI, ML, and Kubernetes without talking about ML ops, which is kind of the DevOps to ML, if you kind of could uh, equate that. So we've talked about you know, the struggles of putting a model into production, right? The difficulties of creating a platform, it's you know, difficult, it's consuming, and, and actually the model development as well. But I, I want to talk about ML operations because that's how we're automating all the problems that we've had uh, up until now and, and all the way from development to production, which is kind of the, the title of today's talk. Um, so the main idea behind ML ops, uh, which is kind of a newly, you know, newly formed operational concept, uh, is that you know, we should be able to do all of this without it being painful and risky. And so it's about bringing collaboration together, all the different personas, data scientists, developers, uh, and building on top of the work that's been done with DevOps and GitOps already, but in a machine learning and AI kind of uh, uh, perspective. So you know, using a single source of truth, 
uh, things like um, automating and securing everything and, and being able to iterate quickly on our applications, which is really important when we're working in such a fast-paced industry. Um, so when we take a glance at this model development lifecycle you know, chart that we looked at earlier, MLOps is here to kind of address and minimize all of this complexity when it comes to developing our models, right? So this includes using maybe tools like Spark for data processing uh, during the preparation phase at the beginning, uh, things like AI and ML pipelines when we're working with deploying our applications and, and, uh, and working with developing models, and then you know, model canary rollouts when it comes to the end. So the entire faucet here we kind of try to address when it comes to ML operations. Um, now, I want to talk a little bit about Open Data Hub and how we're working to bring together all of these projects to kind of speed up the time to market for, for models, right? So this is the platform that we're going to be using for today's demo, uh, which is kind of, as I said before, this open source community project that incorporates a bunch of different open source tools, right? So uh, for the data scientists, they've got their own self-service um, IDEs for, say, Jupyter Hub that they can collaborate with. Uh, use all of the different libraries that they're used to. Um, and this is great because, you know, they already love and work with these tools, so why not just bring it to them, right? Elira for creating pipelines, uh, Kubeflow pipelines for actually running those, doing experiments on our models, fine tuning. Uh, and then KServe Model Mesh, which is going to allow us to deploy the model that we're creating today uh, onto the cluster uh, and take advantage of all the benefits of serverless computing that exist out there as well as things like Prometheus and Grafana for actually monitoring our models uh, and getting the metrics from there. Um, the way it works is uh, we're contributing upstream to these different projects that I just mentioned, uh, and then that is curated into Open Data Hub, which we're using today, uh, which is by itself an operator. So who's heard of Kubernetes operators before? Okay, fantastic. Um, so operators are a way to extend your Kubernetes clusters functionality. Uh, so uh, you can use them from Operator Hub or Artifact Hub. Uh, and it's a simple and easy way to install, uh, you know, whether it be Knative or Grafana or Argo CD or MongoDB, uh, whatever you're working with onto your cluster. Uh, and you get a lot of different features such as auto upgrades and, and whatnot. Um, when it comes to the actual process that we were looking at earlier, uh, you can use all these tools in the data preparation from uh, running experiments directly from Jupyter Hub, right? Uh, and then deploying that model as a service for other applications to take advantage of uh, onto uh, you know, your OpenShift cluster uh, on top of Kubernetes and then gathering metrics. And so that whole life cycle is kind of boiled down. Um, and now we get to the fun part because uh, we get to take a look at the actual tools we're using today. Uh, so we're going to be fine tuning our uh, stable diffusion model today with uh, Kubeflow pipelines. Um, being able to uh, take in some training data uh, and uh, be able to fine tune our model, then serve that model with KServe Model Mesh onto the cluster uh, so that developers can make HTTP or gRPC calls to that application. Uh, so power their, enable, uh, their AI enabled application. Uh, so I know there's a lot of developers here. Yes, that's a good thing. And then um, Backstage, who here has heard of Backstage? Okay, uh, yes, my guy. Um, so Backstage is really cool because it's a really, really popular project right now in CNCF uh, because it can build uh, internal developer platforms uh, and allow uh, platform engineers to be able to come in and uh, kind of really accelerate uh, the, the productivity of our developers, right? Um, you know, who here has, you know, 20 different tabs for all their different tools that they're using, uh, you know, when it comes to software development. You know, it keeps it in one place, uh, and we'll take a look at that as well when it comes to building out our application on the app developer side. Um, a quick slide about the demo we're doing today. We're starting from a data scientist flow uh, of working in a Jupyter Hub notebook uh, to uh, start from a foundational model. Uh, so we're using the Stable Diffusion 1.5, and then we're going to do some fine tuning with Kubeflow on top of Tekton, uh, do some testing, uh, then serve our model. Uh, and of course, you know, we can come back, and this is an iterative process, as we showed before. Uh, and then we're going to switch into the app developer. Uh, so starting off from down here to uh, do some API inferencing uh, on that served model, scaffold a new app that's uh, built uh, a Flask app, and uh, deploy that onto Kubernetes, as well as uh, take advantage of things like Argo CD. Uh, in terms of being able to manage our sync. 
And then, of course, monitoring that. So is everyone ready? Yes. Sweet. Thank you. I'm running out of breath, so I appreciate that. I, I have a question. Yes. Uh, So we're not using Istio. Okay. That's the only thing. Uh, this is just a pretty basic demo. So, uh, but we are using Model Mesh KSERF. Um, but if we're ready to go to the demo, um, I'll go ahead and let me change my screen just a little bit here. Um, show the develop uh, the uh, the data scientist flow to start off with, um, and then we'll refine that model, serve that, and then we'll head over to. Uh, the app, the app developer perspective as well. So let me hop out of here. So um, let me go to, this is Red Hat OpenShift Data Science, which is built on top of ODH, uh, which we're going to be using today, Open Data Hub, sorry. So the only difference really that you'll notice is that the, the logo would be different. Um, but this is kind of where everything starts uh, for our data scientists, for our app developers. Uh, and this kind of shared experience uh, for both of those uh, different personas. Uh, and so this is built on top of our OpenShift cluster. So uh, we can see that here, uh, that we've got this OpenShift r cluster running on top of Kubernetes. Uh, and so what we've done is we've just installed the operator here from uh, Operator Hub. So you can learn more about Open Data Hub uh, here, opendatahub.io, about what the project is, how the project works, uh, and, and learn more about it there. Uh, of course, operators, tons of them. They're really cool. Uh, they make your life easier. That's all I have to say about that. Um, what what RODES, uh, which is the acronym for this OpenShift Data Science, allows you to do uh, is take advantage of um, things like, of course, Jupyter as an IDE, but also um, OpenVINO for um, you know using uh, acceleration for uh, Intel hardware or Starburst or Anaconda, which is really cool. Um, but we'll, what I want to start off with is this data science project. So data science project is kind of a cumulation of all those tools that we just talked about. So for example, um, a, a workbench, which allows the data scientists to be able to collaborate together, right? I'm not a data scientist, but I'm going to pretend like I'm one. Uh, so say I was using uh, a containerized version of PyTorch, right? We've got all these packages included. I can define the limits for my JupyterHub environment. Uh, I can open it. And I can also set permissions for who can access this project, which is pretty cool. Um, but it allows us to do all the testing and, and deploying and pipelines that we need to do here. We can set up storage, data connections. I have a, a connection to a S3 bucket in order to pull down training data and also to upload my, uh, my uh, fine-tuned model in ONNX format. Um, we've got a pipeline down here based on Kubeflow, uh, and we're serving the model already. But I'll get, I'll get back to all of this here in a second because uh, I want to kind of introduce to you the project that we're going to be working with today. Um, so I'll give it a second for JupyterHub to start getting ready. And here we are. So we've got this really cool project that we're going to be running through today. Uh, we're going to start from, of course, JupyterHub. And so what we want to do is uh, work with a text-to-image uh, application uh, for this. We're going to be using uh, a model that's pretty familiar, hopefully, to you guys all. Who's here has used uh, Stable Diffusion? Sweet, cool. Um, stable Fusion, it's great. Uh, you know, you could work with any type of foundational model, uh, but it kind of accelerates our workflow. Yes, sir. Um, I could send you the materials for afterwards. Or do, do you have Jupyter Hub open right now? Because it's. Yeah, yeah, it's on GitHub. Um, we have quite a hefty GPU that we're using in this Kubernetes cluster. But afterwards, I can, uh, I can share with you the, the, the code. Yeah, uh, what I did actually was I just brought in this uh, GitHub repository that we're working with. Um, so I'll share with you that afterwards. Um, and that's some of the integrations that's already built into uh, JupyterHub with the uh, Open Data Hub project. Uh, but what we're, we're going to go ahead and start out uh, doing is to make sure that uh, you know, we're going to be using this hugging face model. So we're checking to make sure that we have uh, GPU access. This is based on NVIDIA's CUDA. Uh, and we're going to install the libraries uh, that we need. So we're going to be working with uh, hugging face diffusers. It's really cool seeing the hugging face guy right upstairs uh, kind of talking about this as well. 
And we're loading in uh, this pre-trained model right here. Uh, so the stable diffusion uh, 1.5. So I'll go ahead and do that as well. And I'll go ahead and clear this now because once we load in uh, this basic vanilla stable diffusion, I, I want it to be able to generate a photo of a dog, right? Uh, so we're going to query prompt, give me a photo of a dog. Uh, and what's you know interesting is it's going to give us any random dog, right? This random dog, pretty cute. But what we want to do is actually fine tune this model to generate photos of uh, Red Hat Teddy. Red Hat Teddy is my colleague's, my friend's dog, um, pretty cute dog, has on a nice fedora. Can't say enough great things about him. Uh, what we're going to try to do is generate a photo of Red Hat Teddy, right? So I'll clear out this and try to regenerate it. And of course, the model hasn't been fine tuned yet. It has no idea what a Red Hat Teddy dog is. So it's going to generate probably another <laughs> random dog. Um, not, the face not even in the, uh, the photo yet. But um, of course, it tried to make its best prediction about what it's going to look like. Um, and so essentially, it's not the right dog we want. And so we've created the second notebook here in order to start the process of fine tuning this model. So of course, we can you know, check for the video memory, uh, install the requirements. We're also going to be uh, training it, so we're installing some other libraries. Um, and what we're going to be doing is uh, essentially loading in some data here from uh, an S3 bucket. So we've got this folder full of uh, nice, nice photos of Teddy. I'll show you guys this here in a second. So we've got about you know, 10, 15 photos of Teddy. You know, Teddy's looking good, handsome dog. Um, but we're going to be using this and feeding this into the model uh, in order to fine tune it, right? So uh, we're going to let know that this is a photo of a Red Hat Teddy dog. Uh, we're going to save this uh, in a second with oh, in an X format in this S3 bucket that we're already connected to through the, uh, this Jupyter Hub notebook. Um, and so uh, the training is going to take a good amount of time, so I'm kind of going to skip through it because I ran through it earlier. What we're going to be using is Dreambooth, right? So Dreambooth is going to allow us to train this model without it forgetting you know, everything that it already knows. And so we've started uh, the, the Dreambooth training. Uh, we gave it time, about 10 minutes. Uh, and what we have afterwards is, uh, is this trained model. Um, so uh, let me see here. We, uh, yeah. So we've got a train model that we've kind of exported after this training has been done. Uh, what we're going to be doing is using ONNX, which is a great format for you know, transporting models and saving models. Uh, and uh, we can even you know, take this and re-upload it to Hugging Face, which would be nice. Uh, but we've got a more fine-tuned model. So we did some uh, query again on it with a prompt of a photo of a Red Hat Teddy dog. And we've got this brand new uh, pre-loaded pre image here that uh, we already created earlier uh, of Teddy. So this is Teddy in a new environment. Uh, and it does. Does it look like Teddy? Pretty well. OK. Um, and so there's a way we could uh, actually you know, automate all of this. And this is uh, through Elyra, uh, one of the tools that we were talking about, of creating all the different steps that we need for this uh, fine tuning to happen, right? So the downloading of the data, as we did manually, the fine tuning uh, using Dreambooth, um, the exporting to ONNX and uploading that to our S3 bucket, uh, as well as generating a sample and uploading a sample. And so uh, we could start that, uh, that training job. Um, so we could also view it here, um, also on uh, the Open Data Hub interface uh, of the actual run. And it might take a few minutes, but I do want to show you what it looks like. See, we're downloading at first the data from the S3 bucket. Doing all of these steps, essentially, if you've used Kubeflow before, this is built on top of Kubeflow. Um, but we're able to uh, view different pipelines that we have. So here is the one that we were using. Um, and we've already ran it beforehand. So if I go back here, I can go to one that's already been completed uh, and view more about it. Five minutes, about. That's how long it took. Um, and uh, you know that allows us to kind of uh, you know, do this repeatable uh, in a repeatable fashion. Sorry, uh, of this training and the fine tuning that we're that we're needing to do. But this isn't the last step. Yes. How do you go from the notebook to this pipeline on the ERP or app? Do you have to do some transformation? It's not automatic, right? Uh, it, it it is automatic. You're talking about the create the the pipeline that we just ran. Yeah, this pipeline here. Mm -hmm. We are looking at the notebook. Red Hat Teddy. Right? That was a notebook. Now we are jumping into ADR pipeline, which is what you're showing now. 
Yes. So how do you go from the notebook to the API pipeline? Uh, so the, the, the integration is already done for you. Um, is it automatic? It is automatic. So as soon as I, so it, it just it just asks to, I'll, I'll run it again. So ADRI is able to loop to read my notebook and turn this into a pipeline. I yes. I can integrate a service rather. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, yeah, it's, it's done automatically. Uh, makes it easy. <laughs> Um, and of course, you know, in the background, all of these steps are being done, you know, through uh, different pods that are being scheduled, which is pretty neat. Um, so that's the fine tuning step, right? Uh, but the, the next step that we have to do is to actually serve this model, right? So I'll show you here uh, in the fine tuning notebook that we have. Um, down here, we have to save to S3, and this has already been done for us. But essentially, we're using uh, a lot of the environment variables that we already have here uh, that con to connect to our specific bucket. And we're uploading the directory of the ONNX format uh, of, the, of the saved model, the trained model, right, already to our S3 bucket. So we've got these paths now uh, for, for example, text to image, text encoder uh, that has our saved uh, ONNX format of this model now in an S3 bucket. Uh, so I could go back over to Open Data Hub uh, and go to Model Serving and deploy this model, right? So we'd select the project, create a name, uh, select custom model server. Um, we're using KServe, so we've got a variety of these different formats here um, to be able to serve the model in. Um, I would just use ONNX. And then we would select uh, my storage, which is that S3 bucket we configured uh, beforehand. And then I would enter in the path of this saved model. Um, so I've already done that here, and I'll go ahead and kind of show it to you. Uh, we've got this uh, text encoder here, uh, which is an internal service that's serving uh, this gRPC URL endpoint. So anytime I'm in this cluster, you know, I could access and do calls to this model that's being served, uh, which is pretty neat. Or you know, in REST or HTTP, uh, a variety of different ways. Uh, and you know, I could. I could say, okay, I want more, uh, you know, CPU or sorry, GPU resource utilization for this, right? I could give it. Uh, well, I'll, I'll just show you actually. So I'll go back here. I'll add a server, uh, and so I could select, uh, you know, if I want two CPUs or ten CPUs or whatever, you know, resource utilization I want for this model to have, you know, I could define that, uh, and you could do that with KServe, uh, vanilla as well, whatever way you want to do it. Um, now, the last part is, with this model being served, right, uh, based on Trident, um, we can go ahead and call this. Uh, so we've got these four models, uh, model mesh serving, text to image, uh, you know, uh, that's being served within the uh, Kubernetes cluster. All right, so what I'm going to go ahead and do uh, is I'll go ahead and install these, well, it should be already installed, these dependencies. Uh, I'm going to make a connection to the gRPC URL. So model mesh serving is what we have, the gRPC port. Uh, is 8080, or 8033, sorry. Um, and we have the name of the text encoder that we're gonna call. So what we're gonna go ahead and do is, instead of loading this model locally with Jupyter Hub, what we're gonna go ahead and do is actually just call it uh, with this um, function that we have right here. So I'll go down here. Uh, the prompt is gonna be, we're gonna put Red Hat Teddy on the beach. Um, and so we're gonna go ahead and do that call, and I'll, I'll start loading these, uh, these cells here. And we already have an old Teddy, but we're going to generate a new one. What's happening, which is really cool, uh, is that instead of using um, the uh, the GPUs from directly uh, uh, directly from Jupyter Hub, what we're doing is we're just using CPU usage instead. Uh, and so it's going to take a little bit longer. But now we're offloading these requests to the KServe um, service that's right here, and you know, in a serverless fashion and everything, to generate now, as we'll see here in a second. Uh, you know, uh, a photo of Teddy on the beach, hopefully. Fingers crossed. So, we'll give it a second. Teddy's on the beach. So, um, that's kind of the whole process of taking this, you know, served model and, and calling it from an endpoint. Um, and so, it's pretty powerful because we're able to, uh, you, know, you know, have it being served and then call it without having to use GPU usage, uh, which is pretty neat. Um, but that's kind of, you know, the, the serving, the inference API that we want to do. Yes? So where is the, uh, the definition of the interface? So here we are using gRPC, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there should be a protocol file template, but if you are using the REST API, which is also another endpoint, 
way the REST uh, API? Is it like because it's with, within one X? I don't know if it's the same API regardless of the model? Or? Um, so you could call it just from the, the endpoints that you're given. For example, if I want to know the REST URL, even that I'm not a compiler, but I want to use your REST, I, I want to use the REST URL. So now I need to know for the REST URL, what is the API? What should be the, what is the API? Meaning what is the answer? What are the parameters? What, should, what JSON format? You know, how many JSON should be formatted and so on. So the question is where? Um, oh, okay. So, if I if I think I understand what you're saying, wait, wait. like right now I have a gRPC call. Right? Yes. In the gRPC call, someone has to to call the gRPC endpoint, which we know what it is, but with specific parameters. Yes, you could you could just change the connection to be a HTTP request in your actual application. Is, how do I know what those parameters are? I mean, that, that, that would, I mean, that would be something that the data scientists would work with the, the application developer for. Um, okay, sure, but I'm talking here. Is there like a protocol definition template? Pro well, let, let, me, let me get back to you after, after the presentation. And we, and we come up here and, 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 and try to code it out. Um, but to, to, to kind of continue on with the flow, once we have uh, the model being served, then me, uh, as an application developer, can come in here and actually work on you know building out an application. Um, so the one that I have here is this Where's Teddy application uh, that's kind of just uh, you know serving or sorry uh, you know doing a uh, prediction um, request uh, on the actual model that we have. Um, so this is probably where you would change in those configurations. Um, so for example, we have this image generator uh, class uh, that we want to do a prompt for. So here we have that same code, um, sorry about that, that same code that we did in the remote inference in order to query the, the GURPC URL. Uh, now we've just packaged this up into uh, um, uh, this application to do the same thing and do these, uh, these uh, prompts. Um, so same code here, uh, we've got this application. Uh, now what we're gonna go ahead and do is use develop, uh, uh, Backstage, which is this offering based on uh, Developer Hub, which is this internal developer platform in order to scaffold this new project out. Uh, and um, and f say for someone who is new to the company, they can learn how the best practices work and how our company is, is organized and, and, and learn about frameworks and, and technologies that we're using. So this is Developer Hub, which is based on Backstage. Um, and it's a bad downstream from our offering called Janus, which is the upstream part. So think of it like the Fedora. So this is just the productized version. Uh, as a platform engineer, I can uh, customize everything here. I can uh, add in new links. I could, um, uh, you know, uh, make it easier for my developers to be able to scaffold new applications. Uh, down here, I have settings for uh, authentication providers. So you'll see that I'm authenticated with GitHub. Uh, and that's because we have this cool organization here called Wind Turbine Inc. Uh, and Wind Turbine Inc. is just a fake company that we've made that has a bunch of data scientists, uh, developers, ML engineers, all in one place. Uh, and so we're going to be simulating this organization uh, as, say, uh, 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 an enterprise that is working to create their model. Uh, so I'll come back here. And this is done through Keycloak, uh, which is a plugin that Red Hat offers for Backstage. So I'll come back here to the home. I'll also show you. Um, something that's called learning paths. So, you know, if I'm new to the company, I can learn about whether it's uh, configuring Jupyter to use GPUs or uh, working with the first APIs or any kind of programming language. This is all customizable uh, to kind of show them the learning paths. Uh, you can also set up different APIs. So, for example, this, uh, this photo generator, I can uh, kind of map in all the relationships, which uh, APIs, the, the API that's being consumed. Um, and, uh, and, and create these new um, APIs to kind of map this all for the organization. But the biggest part about uh, Backstage is definitely these golden path templates, which allow you to scaffold everything that you need for a cloud native application uh, at, in one place and at one time. So uh, a lot of the, the issue is a lot of developers don't, uh, don't know or haven't had the time to get involved in all of these open source projects like Tekton, like Argo CD. Uh, like K-Native. So what 
uh, Backstage does is it actually allows you to, and I'll make this a little bigger, but define all of this in code. Um, so the template.yaml is where this all happens. So we can create templates that, for example, allow you to put in parameters, allow the user to put in parameters, uh, any automation that we want to do. Uh, we could create a skeleton source code uh, project so that it's already designed with our best practices in mind. Uh, we can do uh, GitOps templating, uh, set up an Argo CD application. Um, anything else that we want to do in here, we can do uh, and automate all of the processes of, of building out an application on uh, Kubernetes. So it's pretty neat. So I'll go ahead and open up this, uh, this template that we've made. Um, I'll go select the uh, GitHub organization uh, namespace. Uh, for here, we can create a new namespace from OpenShift. So I'll go back, uh, go back here and do that. Uh, as you can see, we've all already got the uh, inference API uh, that we're using. Um, so we can kind of define that directly in uh, the uh, parameters of this template.yaml, which is pretty neat. So they don't have to enter in anything. Uh, I'll select myself as the owner. So taking advantage of the multi-tenancy that uh, is provided by uh, OpenShift. And then the namespace, we'll create a new one. Uh, and we can call that uh, AI Dev Demo. Cool. So we've created this new namespace. Say I'm working in this one. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and select that there. And we'll go ahead and check that everything's going to be good. It's going to build that specific um, uh, uh, application into a container, store that container into the internal registry, uh, and then deploy that using Argo CD manifest. So here's what the magic, uh, you know, really looks like is that we're generating the source code, uh, into a component, which I'll mention here in a second. We're, uh, invoking the GitHub API to create these new repositories. Uh, we're generating the, uh, uh the deployment resources for our Argo CD. Uh, we're publishing those and we're creating those. And now, uh, if we go over here, we can open up this new component in the catalog for uh, this AI dev demo for the Where's Teddy application. So what I'm going to show you real quick, which is really cool, is that in the wind turbine organization, now there's going to be two new repositories. So we've got a Where's Teddy application, which is just as I showed you, we have the same code. That's going to be invoking the, the model that we're using. All right, so we've built that out. That's our skeleton project. And we also have back here a GitOps uh, repository. So uh, we've got a Helm chart, and we've also got uh, Argo CD, which is just going to define kind of the pipeline um, and, and the deployment of this actual application onto the cluster. So if anything changes in this repository, uh, Argo CD is going to be watching that, and it's going to sync those changes to the cluster. So any uh, you know, modifications I'm making here are going to be synced uh, directly to our Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and this is called a component. So this is uh, uh, kind of like a high-level overview of everything about our application, right? So we've got uh, dependabot alerts. We've got pull request statistics. Uh, we can view the source code. We can view tech docs uh, that we've put in there. Um, we have plugins here, like uh, the OpenShift topology. You can see uh, the applications is scaling. We can see any issues that might be in the repository, uh, pull merge request, plugins like Tekton uh, or Argo CD here, where we can see uh, everything being created, but all just from this one single pane of view. Uh, Kubernetes to, to kind of view the abstracted uh, different uh, services and, and pods and deployments onto the cluster, um, and, uh, and view the API that's been used, all the dependency mapping. It's pretty cool. But that's going to take a few minutes because we're still waiting on the build. Uh, in the deployment of the application. But what we can do is kind of go and check out the, um, the pre-created component that I've already done, uh, that is already finished. Argo CD has already synced. Uh, we can open that up here, uh, which is pretty neat to kind of see everything that's already been happened. Uh, we could open up a, a VS Code instance to start coding on it. But uh, what we're going to go ahead and do is kind of take a look at the OpenShift topology. We can see the deployment here that's been created. Uh, and we can also see uh, the Python Flask application that's been deployed to the cluster, which is pretty cool. Uh, the pod has been created. The service has been created. Uh, and now if we open up this route, um, does someone want to give me a location to put Teddy at? Pinnacles National Park. Pinnacles. Where? I, it might not know it. San Francisco. San Fran. Is that how you spot? 
All right, and we'll give it a second. Uh, and you know, it's just based on stable diffusion. So whatever stable diffusion foundational model knows, uh, then this one will also know as well. Uh, and I want to show you as well that uh, through Argo CD, uh, when we created uh, the, de the deployment for this, uh, this, uh, this pod, if we actually go to the pod, uh, we can see in the environment that it has the access uh, in environment variables to, to be connected to uh, this, the model that's being served. So we've got that same model mesh serving text to image that we had right here uh, and the port 8033. Uh, so we'll go back here. And Teddy is in San Francisco. Voila. Um, you know, we could put Teddy in a variety of other places. I think I put him in the gym earlier. Yeah, you know, dogs have to work out too. Um, and, um, you know, whatever we want to do with our model, this kind of shows the, the, the two sides of, of the, develop, the developers that are scaffolding apps and building these applications, uh, and also the data scientists that's doing all their work uh, in Jupyter Hub. So we've kind of tied together these two different sides into one place. Uh, and that's kind of what this Open Data Hub project does, is it, it, it abstracts a lot of these different open source technologies, but allows you to connect everything together um, and to run experiments uh, and to take advantage of GPU uh, utilization uh, to serve our models um, and to, uh, to learn a lot more, which, uh, which is pretty cool. So uh, let me close out the, uh, the presentation here and love to answer some questions uh, afterwards as well. So uh, I want to kind of talk about a cool instance that we saw with the education industry uh, and uh, uh, for, sorry, uh, the education world for Boston University where uh, we deployed OpenShift data science there uh, and there's hundreds of users and they're able to do their you know, data science experiments and, and automation and, and do all their work within these Jupyter Hub environments. Uh, and uh, you know, it's been pretty cool to see it in that academic perspective. Um, and if you want to try this out yourself, we have this uh, interactive sandbox that is essentially everything we've done today. So red.hat slash roads dash sandbox. Uh, it's a 30 days free instance of this. Uh, and I'll, I'll go back to that. I'll just show you how it works real quick. Um, but essentially, you can take advantage of everything we've done today. You get 14 gigabytes of RAM uh, and 30 gigabytes of, uh, or 40 gigabytes of storage. Don't mind too much Bitcoin. Um, but um, we also have some cool resources here. Uh, so if you want to learn more about uh, the developers.redhat.com program, which is cheat sheets and ebooks, um, we have a new book based on Backstage, which is pretty neat, and um, a, a great book here called GitOps Cookbook about uh, all the different best practices for GitOps automation. Uh, you can learn more about data science here. Uh, and sorry about this. We have the link here on the left that will have everything. Uh, and the slides, of course, uh, will be posted uh, after this session. But yeah, if I go back here, um, you know, you can check out the uh, data science interactive uh, sandbox. And this is different from the one I was just using. This is the one that's completely free. Uh, you get the 14 gigabytes of RAM. And you can do all your data science experiments here for free, uh, as well as taking advantage of GPU acceleration. But that's about everything I have for today. So I want to say thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. And have a great rest of the conference. <laughs>